Good evening. Tonight's story is the weird, funny little legend of the Mad Pudding of Ballybultine by William Carleton, first published in 1845. A few preliminary notes about this story. Firstly, the word pudding has many definitions at different times and places. In this story, a pudding is a kind of dough tied up into a bag and then boiled over a fire. There is no mention of exactly what is being cooked in this pudding, but it doesn't really matter. Secondly, this story does have a lot of unusual words and terms. For the most part, I'm just going to let them be and enjoy the musicality of them. When a term is actually necessary in order to understand the action, I will put the definition on screen. Finally, this story has a character named Harry the Fairyman. You may think that you can't understand him because of my interpretation of the accent or because he's using archaic vocabulary. Not true. Harry the Fairyman is incomprehensible. He speaks nonsense to all people at all times. And so, with no more ado, let's open our imaginations and begin. Mal Roll Rafferty was the son, daughter I mean, of old Jack Rafferty, who was remarkable for a habit he had of always wearing his head under his hat, but indeed the same family was a queer one, as everybody knew that was acquainted with him. It was said of them, but whether it was true or not I won't undertake to say, for afraid I'd tell a lie, that whenever they didn't wear shoes or boots they always went barefooted. But I heard afterwards that this was disputed, so rather than saying anything to injure their character, I let that pass. Now, old Jack Rafferty had two sons, Paddy and Molly. But what are you laughing at? I mean, a son and a daughter. And it was generally believed among the neighbours that they were brother and sister, which, you know, might be true or it might not. But that's a thing that, with the help of goodness, we have nothing to say to. Troth, there was many ugly things put out about them that I don't wish to repeat, such as that neither Jack nor his son Paddy ever walked a perch without putting one foot afore the other like a salmon. And I know it was whispered about that whenever Mulro slept, she had an out-of-the-way custom of keeping her eyes shut. If she did, however, for that matter, the loss was her own, for we all know that when one comes to shut their eyes, they can't see as far before them as another. Mulro was a fine young bouncing girl, large and lavish, with a purdy head of hair on her like scarlet, that being one of the reasons why she was called Ro, or Red. Her arms and cheeks were much the colour of the hair, and her saddle nose was the prettiest thing of its kind that ever was on a face. Her fists, for, thank goodness, she was well served with them too, had a strong similarity to two thumping turnips reddened by the sun, and to keep all right and tight she had a temper as fiery as her head, for, indeed, it was well known that all the Rafferty's were warm-hearted. How and ever, it appears that God gives nothing in vain, and of course the same fists, big and red as they were, if all that is said about them is true, were not so much given to her for ornament as use. At least, taking them in connection with her lively temper, we have it upon good authority that there was no danger of their getting blue mouldered for want of practice. She had a twist, too, in one of her eyes that was very becoming in its way, and made her poor husband, when she got him, take it into his head that she could see round a corner. She found him out in many queer things, without doubt, but whether it was owing to that or not, I wouldn't undertake to say, for afraid I'd tell a lie. Well, begat, anyhow, it was more row that was the dilsey. It happened that there was a nate vagabond in the neighbourhood, just as much overburdened with beauty as herself, and he was named Gusty Gillespie. Gusty, the Lord Gardas, was what they call a black-mouthed Presbyterian, and wouldn't keep Christmas Day the blackguard, except in what they call the old style. Gusty was rather good-looking when seen in the dark, as well as Maul herself, and, indeed, it was pretty well known that, according as the talk went, it was in nightly meetings that they had an opportunity of becoming detached to one another. The consequence was that in due time both families began to talk very seriously as to what was to be done. Maul's brother, Powdy and O'Rafferty, gave Gusty the best of two choices— what they were, it's not worth speaking about, but at any rate, one of them was a poser, and as Gusty knew his man, he soon came to his senses. Accordingly, everything was arranged for their marriage, and it was appointed that they should be spliced by the Rev. Samuel McShuttle, the Presbyterian parson, on the following Sunday. 
Now, this was the first marriage that had happened for a long time in the neighbourhood between a black mouth and a Catholic. And, of course, there were strong objections in both sides against it. And, begat, only for one thing, it would never have took place at all. At any rate, Faith, there was one of the bride's uncles, old Harry Connolly, a fairy man, who could cure all complaints with a secret he had. And as he didn't wish to see his niece married upon such a fellow, he fought bitterly against the match. All Mole's friends, however, stood up for the marriage barring him, and of course the Sunday was appointed, as I said, that they were to be dovetailed together. Well, the day arrived, and Mole, as became her, went to Mass and Gusty to meeting, after which they were to join one another in Jack Rafferty's, where the priest, Father McSorley, was to slip up after Mass to take his dinner with him, and to keep Mr. McShuttle, who was to marry them, company. Nobody remained at home but old Jack Rafferty and his wife, who stopped to dress the dinner, for, to tell the truth, it was to be a great let-out entirely. And maybe, if all was known too, that Father McSorley was to give them a cast of his office over and above the minister, in regard that Maul's friends were not altogether satisfied at the kind of marriage which McShuttle could give them. The sorrow may care about that, splice here, splice there, all I can say is that when Mrs. Rafferty was going to tie up a big bag pudding, in walks Harry Connolly, the ferryman, in a rage, and he shouts out, Blood and bonder bushes, what are you here for? Huh? Why, Harry? Why, Vic? Why, the sun's in the suds and the moon in the high horrocks. There's a clip stick coming on, and here you're both as unconcerned as if it was about to rain mither. Go out and cross yourselves three times in the name of the four Mandrovians, for, as the prophecy says, fill the pot, Eddie, supernaculum, ablaze and stars a rare spectaculum. Go out, both of you, and look at the sun, I say, and you'll see the condition he's in. Be off! Be gad, sure enough, Jack gave a bound to the door, and his wife leapt like a two-year-old, till they were both got on a stile beside the house to see what was wrong in the sky. Hurrah, what is it, Jack? says she. Can you see anything? No, says he. Sore full of my eye, anything I can spy, barring the sun himself, that's not visible in regard of the clouds. Could guard us, I doubt there's something to happen. If there wasn't, Jack, what would put Harry, that knows so much, in the state he's in? I doubt it's this marriage, says Jack. But to ourselves, it's not over and above religious for Maul to marry a black mouth, and only for... Uh, but it can't be helped now, although you see not a taste of the sun willing to show his face upon it. As to that, says the wife, winking with both her eyes, if Gusty's satisfied with more, it's enough. I know who'll carry the whip hand anyhow. But in the meantime, let us ax Harry within what ails the sun. Well, they accordingly went in and put a question to him. Harry, what's wrong, Agur? What is it now? For if anybody alive knows, tis yourself. Ah, said Harry, screwing his mouth with a kind of dry smile. The sun has had a horrid twist to the colic, but never mind that. I tell you, you'll have a merrier wedding than you think, that's all. And having said this, he put on his hat and left the house. Now, Harry's answer relieved them very much, and so, after calling him to be back for the dinner, Jack sat down to take a slough of the pipe, and the wife lost no time in tying up the pudding and putting it in the pot to be boiled. In this way, things went on well enough for a while, Jack smoking away and the wife cooking and dressing at the rate of a hunt. At last, Jack, while sitting, as I said, contentedly at the fire, thought he could perceive an odd dancing kind of motion in the pot that puzzled him a good deal. Catty, said he, what the dickens is in this pot on the fire? Never a thing but the big pudding. Why do you ask? says she. Why, said he, if ever a pot took it into its head to dance a jig, and this did. Thunder and sparbles, look at it. Begad, it was true enough. There was the pot bobbing up and down and from side to side, jigging it away as merry as a grig, and it was quite easy to see that it wasn't the pot itself, but what was inside of it that brought about the hornpipe. Be the hole in my coat, shouted Jack. There's something alive in it, or it would never cut such capers. Be Cora, there is, Jack. Something strange entirely has got into it. What, man alive, what's to be done? Just as she spoke, the pot seemed to cut the buckle in prime style, and after a sprig that had shame a dancing master, off flew the lid, and out bounced the pudding itself, hopping as nimble as a pea on a drumhead about the floor. 
Jack blessed himself and Catty crossed herself. Jack shouted and Catty screamed, In the name of goodness, keep your distance. No one here injured you. The pudding, however, made a set at him and Jack leapt first on a chair and then on the kitchen table to avoid it. Then danced toward Catty, who was now repeating her prayers at the top of her voice while the cunning thief of a pudding was hopping and jigging it round her as if it was amused at her distress. If I could get the pitchfork, says Jack, I'd deal with it. By goxty, I'd try its metal. No, no, shouted Catty, thinking there was a fairy in it. Let us make it fair. Who knows what harm it might do? Easy now, said she to the pudding. Easy, dear. Don't harm honest people that never meant to offend you. It wasn't us. No, and in truth, it was old Harry Connolly that bewitched you. Pursue him if you wish, but spare a woman like me, for, whisper dear, I'm not in a condition to be frightened. Troth, I'm not. The pudding bedad seemed to take her at her word and danced away from her towards Jack, who, like the wife believing there was a fairy in it and that spaking it fair was the best plan, thought he would give it a soft word as well as her. Please, your honour, said Jack. She only speaks the truth, and upon my veracity, we both feel so much obliged to your honour for your quietness. Face, it's quite clear that if you weren't a gentlemanly pudding all out, you'd act otherwise. Old Harry, the rogue, is your mark, and he's just gone down the road there, and if you go fast, you'll overtake him. Be me song, your dancing master did his duty anyhow. Thank your honour. Uh, God speed you, and may you never meet with a parson or alderman in your travels. Just as Jack spoke, the pudding appeared to take the hint, for it quietly hopped out, and, as the house was directly on the roadside, turned down toward the bridge, the very way that old Harry went. It was very natural, of course, that Jack and Catty should go out to see how it intended to travel, and, as the day was Sunday, it was but natural, too, that a greater number of people than usual were passing the road. This was a fact, and when Jack and his wife were seen following the pudding, the whole neighbourhood was soon up and after it. Jack Rafferty, what is it? Catty, Hawker, will you tell us what it means? Why, replied Catty, it's my big pudding that's bewitched, and it's now hot foot pursuing. Here she stopped, not wishing to mention her brother's name. Uh, someone or other that surely put pish rogues on it. This was enough. Jack, now seeing that he had assistance, found his courage coming back to him. So says he to Catty, Go home, says he, and lose no time in making another pudding as good. And here's Paddy Scanlon's wife, Bridget, says she'll let you boil it on her fire, as you'll want our own to dress the rest of the dinner. And Paddy himself will lend me a pitchfork for pursuing to the morsel of that same pudding will escape till I let the wind out of it, now that I've the neighbours to back and support me, says Jack. This was agreed to, and Catty went back to prepare fresh pudding, while Jack and half the townmen pursued the other with spades, grapes, pitchforks, scythes, flails, and all possible description of instruments. On the pudding went, however, at the rate of about six Irish miles an hour, and such a chase never was seen. Catholics, Protestants, and Presbyterians were all after it, armed, as I said, and bad end to the thing, but its own activity could save it. Here it made a hop, and there a prod was made at it, but off it went, and someone, as eager to get a slice at it on the other side, got the prod instead of the pudding. Big Frank Farrell, the miller of Ballyboltine, got a prod backwards that brought a hullabaloo out of him you might hear at the other end of the parish. One got a slice of a scythe, another the whack of a flail, the third a rap of a spade that made him look nine ways at once. "'Where's it going?' asked one. My life for you, it's on its way to meeting. Three cheers for it if it turns to Carntowl. Prod the soul out of it if it's a Protestant, shouted the others. If it turns to the left, slice it into pancakes. We'll have no Protestant puddings here. Begad, by this time the people were on the point of beginning to have a regular fight about it, when, very fortunately, it took a short turn down a little by-lane that led toward the Methodist Freighton House, and in an instant all parties were in an uproar against it as a Methodist pudding. It's a Wesleyan, shouted several voices. And by this and by that in a Methodist chapel, it won't put a foot today or we'll lose a fall. Let the wind out of it. Come, boys, where's your pitchforks? The devil pursuant to the one of them, however, ever could touch the pudding. And just when they thought they had it up against the gavel of the Methodist chapel, begad, it gave them the slip and hops over to the left clean into the river and sails away before all their eyes as light as an eggshell. Now, 
It so happened that a little below this place, the domain wall of Colonel Bragshaw was built up to the very edge of the river on each side of its banks, and so, finding there was a stop put to their pursuit of it, they went home again, every man, woman, and child of them puzzled to think what the pudding was at all, what it meant, or where it was going. Had Jack Rafferty and his wife been willing to let out the opinion they had about Harry Connolly bewitching it, there's no doubt of it, but poor Harry might have been badly treated by the crowd when their blood was up. They had sense enough, how and ever, to keep that to themselves, for Harry, being an old bachelor, was a kind friend to the Rafferty's. So, of course, there was all kinds of talk about it, some guessing this and some guessing that, one party saying the pudding was of their side, another party denying it and insisting it belonged to them, and so on. In the meantime, Katie Rafferty, afraid the dinner might come short, went home and made another pudding much about the same size as the one that had escaped, and, bringing it over to their next neighbour, Paddy Scanlans, it was put into a pot and placed on the fire to boil, hoping that it might be done in time, especially as they were to have the minister, who loved a warm slice of a good pudding as well as air a gentleman in Europe. Anyhow, the day passed. Maul and Gusty were made man and wife, and no two could be more loving. Their friends that had been asked to the wedding were sauntering about in pleasant little groups till dinner time, chatting and laughing, but, above all things, striving to account for the figuries of the pudding, for, to tell the truth, its adventures had now gone through the whole parish. Well, at any rate, dinner time was drawing near, and Paddy Scannon was sitting comfortably with his wife at a fire, the pudding boiling before their eyes, when in walks Harry Connolly, in a flutter, shouting, "'Blood and bonderbushes! What are you here for?' "'Why, Harry, why, Vic?' said Mrs. Scanlon. "'Why,' said Harry, "'the sun's in the suds and the moon and the high horrocks. "'There's a clapstick coming on, "'and you sit there as unconcerned as if it was about a rain mether. "'Go out, both of you, and look at the sun, I say, "'and you'll see the condition he's in. "'Off!' "'Hi, but, Harry, what's that rolled up in the tail of your cothamore?' How oh, it is, said Harry, and pray against the clipstick, the sky's fallen. Begat, it was hard to say whether Paddy or the wife got out first. They were so much alarmed by Harry's wild, thin face and piercing eyes, so out they went to see what was wonderful in the sky, and kept looking and looking in every direction, but not a thing was to be seen, barring the sun shining down with great good humour, and not a single cloud in the sky. Paddy and the wife now come in laughing to scold Harry, who, no doubt, was a great wag in his way when he wished. Musha, bad's grand to you, Harry. They had time to say no more, how and ever, for as they were going in the door, they met him coming out with a reek of smoke in his tail like a lime kiln. Harry, shouted Bridget, my soul to glory, but the tail of your cothamore's a fire, you'll be burned. Don't you see the smoke that's out of it? "'Cross yourselves three times,' said Harry, without stopping, or even looking behind him. "'For, as the prophecy says, fill the pot, Eddie.' They could hear no more, for Harry appeared to feel like a man that carried something a great deal hotter than he wished, as anyone might see by the liveliness of his motions and the queer faces he was forced to make as he went along. "'What the dickens is he carrying in the skirts of his big coat?' asked Paddy. My soul to happiness, but maybe he has stole a pudding, said Bridget, for it's known that many a strange thing he does. They immediately examined the pot, but found that the pudding was there as safe as tuppence, and this puzzled them the more to think what it was he could be carrying about with him in the manner that he did. But little they knew what he had done while they were sky-gazing. Well, anyhow, the day passed and the dinner was ready, and no doubt but a fine gathering there was to partake of it. The Presbyterian minister met the Methodist preacher, a devilish stretcher of an appetite he had in troth, on their way to Jack Rafferty's, and, as he knew he could take the liberty, why he insisted on dining with him. So, after all, begat, in them times the clergy of all descriptions lived upon the best footing among one another. times, the clarity of all descriptions lived upon the best footing among one another, not all as one now, but no matter. When they had nearly finished their dinner, when Jack Rafferty himself asked Catty for the pudding, and just as he spoke, in it came as big as a mess pot. A gentleman, said he, 
I hope none of you will refuse tasting a bit of Catty's pudding. I don't mean the dancing one that took to its travels today, but a good solid fellow that she made since. To be sure we won't, replied the priest. So, Jack, put the trifle on them three plates at your right hand and send them over here to the clergy. And maybe, he said, laughing, for he was a droll, good-humoured man, maybe, Jack, we won't set you a proper example. With a heart and a half, your reverence and gentlemen, in troth, it's not a bad example ever any of you set us or the likes, or ever will set us, I'll go bail. And surely only wish it was better fare I had for you, but we're humble people, gentlemen, and so you can't expect to meet here what you would in higher places. Better a male of herbs, said the Methodist preacher, where pace is. He had time to go no further, however, for much to his amazement, the priest and the minister started up from the table just as he was going to swallow the first spoonful of the pudding, and before you could say Jack Robinson, away started at a lively jig down the floor. At this moment, a neighbor's son came running in and told them that the parson was coming to see the new married couple and wish them all happiness, and the words were scarcely out of his mouth when he made his appearance. And what to think he knew not when he saw the minister footing it away at the rate of a wedding. He had very little time, however, to think, for before he could sit down, up starts the Methodist preacher, and clapping his two fists at his side, chimes in a great style along with him. Chuck Rafferty says he, and, by the way, Jack was his tenant. What the dickens does all this mean, says he. I'm amazed. The not a particle of me can tell you, says Jack. But will your reverence just taste a morsel of pudding, merely that the young couple may boast that you ate at their wedding? For sure, if you wouldn't, who would? Well, says he, to gratify them I will, so just a morsel. But Jack, this bates Banneker, says he again, putting the spoonful of pudding into his mouth. Has there been drink here? Oh, the devil is spoot, said Jack. For although there's plenty in the house, faith, it appears the gentlemen wouldn't wait for it. And as they took it elsewhere, I can make nothing of this. He had scarcely spoken when the parson, who was an active man, cut a caper a yard high, and you could bless yourself the three clergy were hard at work dancing, as if for a wager. Begad, it would be impossible for me to tell you the state the whole meeting was in when they seen this. Some were hoarse with laughing, some turned up their eyes with wonder, many thought them mad, and others thought they had turned up their little fingers a trifle too often. Be gory, it's a burn and shame, said one, to see three black-mouthed clergy in such a state at this early hour. Thunder and ounds, what's over them at all, says others. Why, one would think they're bewitched. Holy Moses, look at the caper the Methodist cut. And as for the rector, who would think he could handle his feet at such a rate? Be this and be that, he cuts the buckle, and does the trembling step equal to Paddy Horrigan, the dancing master himself. And see, bad says to the morsel of the parson what's not hard at pace upon a trencher, and it of a Sunday too. Horrid gentlemen, the fun's in yous after all. Whoosh, more power to you. The sorrow's own fun they had, and no wonder, but judge of what they felt when all at once they saw old Jack Rafferty himself bouncing in among them and footing it away like the best of them. But dad, no play could come up to it, and nothing could be heard but laughing, shouts of encouragement, and clapping a hand like mad. Now, the minute Jack Rafferty left the chair where he had been carving the pudding, old Harry Connolly comes over and claps himself down in his place in order to send it round, of course. And as he was scarcely sated, when who should make his appearance but Barney Hartigan, the piper? Barney, by the way, had been sent for early in the day, but being from home when the message for him sent, he couldn't come any sooner. Begora, said Barney, you're early at the work, gentlemen. But what does this mean? But... Devon may care, you shan't want the music while there's blast in the pipes anyhow. So saying, he gave them jig pulled hook, and after that kiss my lady in his best style. In the meantime, the fun went on thick and threefold, for it must be remembered that Harry, the old knave, was at the pudding, and maybe he didn't serve it about in double quick time too. The first he helped was the bride, and before he could say chopstick, she was at it hard and fast before the Methodist preacher, who gave a jolly sprig before her that threw him into convulsions. Harry liked this, and made up his mind soon to find partners for the rest, so he accordingly sent the pudding about like lightning, and, to make a long story short, barring the piper himself, there wasn't a pair of heels in the house, but was as busy at the dancing as if their lives depended on it. Barney, 
says Harry. Just taste a morsel of this pudding. Devil the sort of bully of a pudding every eight. Here, your soul, try a snig of it. It's beautiful. To be sure I will, says Barney. I'm not the boy to refuse a good thing, but Harry be quick, for you know my hands is engaged, and it would be a thousand pities not to keep them in music, and they so well inclined. Thank you, Harry. Be God, that is a famous pudding, but blood and turnips, what's this for? The word was scarcely out of his mouth when he bounced up, pipes and all, and dashed into the middle of the party. Hurroo, your swords, let us make a night of it. The Ballyboutine boys for ever. Go it, your reverence. Turn your partner, heel and toe, minister. Good, well done again. Whoosh, hurroo, here's for Ballyboutine and the sky over it. Bad luck to the sitch a sit was seen together in this world, or will again, I suppose. The worst, however, wasn't come yet, for just as they were in the very heat and fury of the dance, who do you think comes hopping in amongst them but another pudding, as nimble and merry as the first? That was enough. They had all heard of the ministers among the rest, and most of them had seen the other pudding, and knew there must be a fairy in it, sure enough. Well, as I said, Enid comes to the thick of them, but the very appearance of it was enough. Off the three clergy danced, and off the whole wedding danced after them, every one making the best of their way home, but not a soul of them able to break out a step if they were to be hanged for it. Troth, it wouldn't leave a laugh in you to see the parson dancing down the road on his way home, and the minister and the Methodist preacher cutting the buckle as they went along in the opposite direction. To make short work of it, they all danced home at last, with scarce a puff of wind in them. The bride and the bridegroom danced away to bed, and now, boys, come and let us dance the horror league in the barn it out. But you see, boys, before we go, and in order that I may make everything plain, I had as good as tell you that Harry, in crossing the bridge of Ballyboltine, a couple of miles below Squire Bragshaw's domain wall, saw the pudding floating down the river. The truth is, he was waiting for it, but be this as it may, he took it out, for the water had made it clean as a new pin, and, tucking it up in the tail of his big coat, contrived, as you all guess, I suppose, to change it, while Paddy Scanlon and the wife were examining the sky, and, for the other, he contrived to bewitch it in the same manner, by getting a fairy to go into it, for, indeed, it was pretty well known that the same Harry was hand and glove with the good people. Others would tell you that it was half a pound of quicksilver he put into it, but that doesn't stand to raisin. At any rate, boys, I have told you the adventures of the mad pudding of Ballyboltine, but I don't wish to tell you many other things about it that happened, for afraid I'd tell a lie. Amazing that this storm just blew up out of nowhere and really cast a different mood upon the story. The best sentence in this story is Gusty was rather good looking when seen in the dark, as well as Maul herself. I think this story is just so much fun. There's a lightness and a playfulness about it that I really love. I love how the ferryman is opposed to the wedding, but his way of objecting is to enchant the pudding and make everybody dance. I love how the villagers just all go nuts grabbing pitchforks and chasing after the pudding for no reason at all, but debating its religion. And I love how everybody is just enthusiastic and laughing at the dancing rather than being distressed or upset or frustrated about it. Then it all starts with the clergy, and then everyone dances home. It all feels very kind of village life, where everybody is kind of excited and enthusiastic about anything that's new and unexpected, and it gave them something to talk about for years. Many of the stories in the Irish fairy book, especially those written in the vernacular, were documented by a writer or a folklorist as it was told to them. On the contrary, I personally think this story was original fiction by William Carleton in the style of the Irish vernacular folklore. I can't find any such place as Ballyboltine or any other locations in the text, even with a lot of variations in the spelling, and there aren't any similar tales from different sources that I could find. A quick note, though, on versions and variations. I first read this story in Albert Percival Graves' Irish Fairy Book, published in 1909, and I have used the illustrations from that book in this video. However, I've used the 1845 text of the story, which is longer and better. The Graves version was edited in a way that doesn't make much sense. I mean, not that the story makes much sense to begin with, but you know what I mean. I think perhaps maybe there was a sort of Victorian thing where they wanted to avoid the implication that Maul was pregnant and that's what caused the uh, wedding. The beginning is much, much shorter. 
This story was originally published as Mall Rose Wedding by William Carleton in his 1845 book, Tales and Sketches, illustrating the character, usages, traditions, sports, and pastimes of the Irish peasantry. In 1888, it was published as The Pudding Bewitched in Yeats's Fairy and Folk Tales of the Irish Peasantry, before being published as The Mad Pudding of Ballyboltine in the Irish Fairy Book in 1909. William Carleton was born in 1794 in County Tyrone, which would someday become part of Northern Ireland after partition. He was raised a Catholic and he was first educated in illegal Catholic hedge schools. In fact, he originally intended to enter the church. However, he was dissuaded from entering the church by an ominous dream, and after he undertook a traditional pilgrimage at the age of 19, he converted to Protestantism. Eventually, he moved to Dublin, and in 1830, he published his first book, Traits and Stories of the Irish Peasantry. These story collections were extremely popular, and they made him famous. And he wrote these kinds of stories drawn from his youth throughout the 1830s and 40s. He published them in Dublin magazines, and then they were collected in books. His own original fiction and his autobiographical works were never popular, and in fact, he himself was always controversial and frequently disliked. His writing often mocked the Irish lower classes and played up to stereotypes about drinking and violence. He wrote often and strongly about the religious divide in the country, and his writing became increasingly political over time. And of course, in a divided country and in a divided time, his opinions couldn't have pleased either side of the debate, but he also didn't try to avoid controversy or to make any friends, and therefore succeeded in offending everybody. He died in his mid-70s in poverty, and one of his very last friends at the end of his life was a Catholic priest who offered to perform the last rites for him, but he politely declined on the grounds that he hadn't been a Catholic for decades. Although he was never conventionally successful, and despite massive output, didn't enjoy lasting fame or popularity, his writing did anticipate a revival in the interest in traditional Irish tales and culture, which partially explains why this particular story has been reprinted so often. In recent years, it's even been reprinted without crediting him at all, which really seems a shame to me. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that because we just did sort of England, Scotland last week, I would normally not have gone right to Ireland this week, but this story was so fun, I found it irresistible. Although if I had known a storm was going to come up, I would have chosen a spooky story. Researching William Carleton's history got me on a whole sidetrack about hedge schools and the educational tradition in Ireland. So in ancient times, poetry was one of the most important trades on the island. There's an old Irish legal tract, probably dating back to the 7th or 8th century, that lists the seven grades of poet in Irish society and the rank that they have compared to everybody else and the pay that they could earn for the meters they performed and the type of work that they do. In ancient times, the craft of poetry was descended from the magic of the druids and the bards had this power to either cast glory or shame upon your house, hence the rank of the bards in Irish society. The formality of their role and their hereditary place in the clan and the cultural refinement of Irish literature created this very stable, prestigious poetic tradition that endured for centuries. With the coming of Christianity, poets received something of a demotion. They only ranked about as high as a bishop, but they continued to have a prestigious role in society, and they had their own educational system, the bardic schools. During the 16th and 17th century, a series of repressive laws increasingly disbanded Irish society and traditions, and eventually, in 1723, only Anglican schools were allowed. So this led the teachers of the old bardic schools and the Catholic priests to start these clandestine informal education programs that were called hedge schools. These underground schools were absolutely amazing. They taught basic education like reading and math, but like good Catholic schools, they also taught Greek and Latin and the classic literature. And like good Irish schools, they taught the Gaelic language and the old code of conduct of the Irish clans and stories and songs of the ancient kings and the great Irish heroes. According to Wikipedia, there was an MP in Parliament at the time who complained about the quote, the young peasants of Kerry running around in rags with Cicero or Virgil under their arms. 
the most promising students were often sent to one of the Irish colleges in mainland Europe, where traditional Catholic Irish education was legal. Formal Catholic education was reintroduced to Ireland in about 1800, which eventually led to the decline of hedge schools. In impoverished areas, they persisted until about as late as 1890. I think it's amazing that a people who were so downtrodden and poverty-stricken would still come together in their communities to find a way to educate their children in their language and their beliefs and their culture, and to work so hard to maintain their identity in the face of that kind of oppression. I've always been in awe of the amazing literary history of Ireland. The idea that like the King's Guard should be as skilled in song and in rhyme as they are in weapons and in fighting, but I really didn't know anything about these underground schools. So maybe in my own small way, I'm trying to do something similar with restored lore. Every week I find an interesting, odd, old story and I try to help it find a new audience, a new impact, and new relevance. Or perhaps I'm just amusing myself and we are amusing each other. <laughs> Either way, we are creaking ever closer to 500 subscribers, which would be an amazing milestone. So please like, subscribe, and share this video to help the little community grow. Thank you so, so much for all the support and I will see you next week.